I um, an, am a nature-based psychotherapist and anthropologist, and I teach woodland living skills. Today I want to speak a little bit about uh, our relationship with nature as people of colour. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about myself um, and my upbringing in a rural uh, setting in the English countryside. Uh, look a little bit at my eth ethnographic research on the relationships that people of colour have with the natural world. And look also at white attitudes to black presence in green spaces. And look at a sense of community and belonging that is developing amongst black communities in London. And also look at black leadership in nature. So a little bit about myself as a nature-based psychotherapist. In addition to exploring our personal and intimate social relationships, nature-based psychotherapy gives the opportunity to explore our relationship with the natural world. All of the therapeutic encounter takes place in nature, in, in parks and woods. For some people, it's simply a beautiful setting to meet to have uh, a therapeutic engagement which feels less intense than indoors. And for others, the work goes much deeper using the metaphors and synchronicity that we see in nature, but also really uh, raising awareness of the quality of the bond and attachment that we have to the natural world. So my journey into nature-based psychotherapy and woodland living skills came from growing up in the countryside um, I'm adopted by white parents who lived in Suffolk. So my upbringing um, was very immersed in nature. I grew up in a small holding uh, with animals and with uh, no fences between um, our small farm and the open uh, farmland beyond. So I spent my childhood uh, roaming, enjoying, learning all about of the natural world. I loved to learn about what I could eat, um, how to look after myself, because the more I knew about the natural world, the less I had to go home. So without realizing these things had names, I really enjoyed things like foraging, uh, tracking animals, looking at the signs of their, their tracks, their feeding signs. Really looking at the sky, I would cycle and walk from, for miles away from home, and I was very conscious of, is it gonna rain? Is there a storm coming? And really appreciating the development of clouds and other signs that, that told me about the weather. And I, I now teach natural navigation, which is the, the art of finding orientation and, and direction through signs in nature. Um, little did I know that just my play, my enjoyment of, of uh, nature was taking me in a direction that would later uh, become a career. I really appreciated a very strong relationship with the natural world, but socially it was much more isolating where I felt a very strong sense of belonging within nature. Uh, that was never something that I experienced within the white community around me. I was always another, and very often always the first black person uh, that other people encountered, and so um, would respond in that way. Their curiosity, their interest, um, was always to remark about my, how unusual I was, or why was I here, or where was I from. Um, so it was a very... Um, isolating experience being in the natural world. That's not an emotion I experienced being in nature, but um, in being part of the community, that was a very strong emotion. So I eventually made my own migration into cities, particularly for university and for work. And it took me a little while to uh, put my finger on why I felt a bit off. And it was because I wasn't spending as much time in nature where growing up in the countryside, it, it was immediate. You couldn't miss nature. I realized that living in cities, you had to make a bit more effort to go out and find her. Uh, as soon as I had that realization, I could get back into making nature a meaningful part of my everyday life. But what it gave me was that experience of what it's like to feel disconnected, uh, and it wasn't good. And when I moved into cities, I became aware that there were communities of people that had never had that original contact with nature to know what they might be missing. And that really struck me. Um, I'd heard people uh, reference disconnection, um, but to actually see what it meant, um, where not only uh, was nature not normal, it was really alien. So that brings me to talking um, about my work with Wild in this city. Um, Wild in the city is supporting people in urban areas to have more meaningful contact with nature, um, to understand how nature can support our emotional health, but also bring endless opportunities for recreation and for socialising. 
And through this work, um, I've been engaging people of colour. Um, we didn't start out that way. We started out working with everybody, but it soon became clear that not everybody wanted to work with a black-led nature organisation. And I'll talk about that uh, more in a little while. So what we've done through our work, um, working with people of colour, is some ethnographic research, looking at what is our relationship with nature, how do we feel about it, how do we engage. And I mean, the, the process of writing it up now, but some of the themes that are coming through is that uh, we are less, we spend less time um, in the natural world, which is often interpreted that we're less connected, but I don't think that's true. I think that there are human dynamics in why we spend less time in nature, which have nothing necessarily to, necessarily to do with how we feel about nature. And it's often how we're received and responded to in the countryside and more rural settings that uh, can be off-putting rather than any experience of nature directly. So in our we tend typically to be much more connected to nature and our countries of heritage, but something seems to happen when we come to, to the West. There's a disconnect. And some of the themes about why this is um, start right from the moment of our migration, uh, where there's huge pressure to create lives and stability, and there's a tendency to migrate uh, for the safety of numbers, uh, and they tend to be in cities. So we gather in cities to have uh, support networks to help us meet our needs, to help find jobs, uh, to have people that um, have the same linguistic background. And our, well, depending on your age, whether it's grandparents, great-grandparents, or even parents, um, often had experiences of, of hostility, which is intimidating enough when you are amongst other people of colour, but is even more so when you move into remote areas um, where there are fewer people that look like you. And the sense of vulnerability increases um, with your sense of visibility and exposure. So it led to a pattern of older generations not wanting to venture into nature through the, the pressures of establishing um, a life uh, in the UK, but also through fear of um, racism and hostility. This then starts to lead into generations um, of people of colour uh, that aren't taken uh, by their parents, and so nature doesn't become normal. Also, older generations sometimes have a protective attitude that they might put off their children and family from going into natural spaces because they want to protect them. There's a, a fear and anxiety about being in those spaces. What now tends to happen is that there's a, a loss of generational knowledge that we typically we'd have in countries of heritage where we learn about the natural world through conversation, through relationship with our elders that our elders in the UK perhaps uh, don't know about the names of plants and trees and animals in, in the UK, so have uh, less or no information to pass on, and perhaps don't have connections with established or local white communities to learn from. So then an apprehension starts to creep in, um, a sense of um, embarrassment or awareness of not knowing about how to be, how to access um, natural spaces, and what it is that we're looking at, what we're engaging with. Whereas in countries of heritage, nature was very familiar. Uh, in the UK, it starts to become a stranger. There's also the pressure to be successful within a city context. And the values and codes of what it means to be successful in the city is very different to what it is to be successful um, in the countryside. So we start to see a more urban identity, sort of a hyper-urban identity, where very often um, who we are as people of colour is defined in opposition to nature. The idea that black people don't hike, we don't swim, um, we don't ski are quite common tropes. Um, that it becomes part of our identity that um, that's not for us, that's something for white people, it's something for middle class people. And within that, there is a, a shame. Um, connection with nature has been stigmatized through narratives of colonialism and slavery, where we were told that our lifestyles, living close to nature, were a sign of our backwardness, of us being primitive. So there's a desire for some people in moving to the West, but also into cities, of leaving something behind. Um, they feel they're stepping into progress and don't want necessarily to be associated with a connection with nature, which is seen as backwards. 
For people that have a recent history of subsistence or living off the land, nature might also be associated with hardship and struggle. Whereas in the West, we typically tend to think of time in nature as being about leisure and recreation. So there's a lot of shame-based feelings about nature, about wanting to step away from to, to show that um, we're now of a better status um, in building our lives in the UK. Within this, um, a lot of people of colour will own this as a positive statement, that they don't like nature, that they like the urban. But within that, there is uh, a lot of loss and a lot of coping. Um, a coping strategy is often deployed uh, to prevent us from feeling the pain of the loss. So comments like, black people don't hike, we don't walk, we don't wear wellies, are also a way of coping with something we don't feel we've got easy access to. Um, it's called avoidance. Well, I didn't want it anyway. It's dirty, it's stupid, why would I want to go there? So a lot of the work that we're doing um, with Wild in the City is also uh, addressing a trauma and repairing um, a sense of loss that people have in, in not being uh, in close relationship to the nature, of overcoming uh, often um, unconscious feelings of, of shame in, in spending time in nature. I was working with one woman and it, it started to rain and she automatically said, well, we must go in. And we just paused and said, well, well, why? What's wrong with being in the rain? And she reflected that for her mother, that would be a sign that she's really not well. There's something psychologically wrong. It's madness to stand out in the rain or the wind. Uh, it's simply not something that would ever have occurred to her. So in many ways, um, there are... Uh, sort of self-limiting myths that we've developed that keep us away from the natural world. But part of the reason they developed was through, at the time, a sense of protecting us from engagement that, that could lead to hostility. So I'm going to move on. And, oh, poverty also um, was a big theme that, that came up. Um, that for people that don't have much money to have a second set of clothes that could get dirty, there was a huge pressure on keeping clean, and so keeping away from nature was very much connected to that, which is in great contrast to typical middle white, uh, middle class uh, culture, where getting dirty in nature is a sign of good, healthy fun. It's a sign of an afternoon well spent and of, of being productive. So there's very different pressures on um, people of colour growing up that they knew if they got dirty, they, they could get a good hiding from their mum for ruining their trainers or, or getting their, their trousers dirty. Um, so there's, there's all sorts of messages that might be picked up that says stay away, it's wrong or it's inappropriate. The reason why this matters, this disconnection, uh, is because that we're then uh, missing out on the wonderful health benefits that there are from being in contact with nature but we're also less involved in conserving and, and protecting these areas. I want to spend a little bit of time talking about white attitudes to black presence in green spaces. Um, in the environmental field at the moment, there's a lot of conversation about how to be more inclusive and how to diversify. But very often their starting point is black or people of colour have a problem with nature. But I think that's, that's a flawed starting point. In my experience growing up in the countryside and also as a working professionally leading uh, uh, courses and leading an organisation, there's very much an attitude perhaps of uh, white people having issues with black people being in nature. Continually, people, people of colour share that they don't feel that they belong, and that's demonstrated to them from a whole range of behaviours, from being stared at, from being followed, uh, from being questioned, um, and also hostile encounters of, of uh, verbal abuse and, and uh, physical assault. In my experience, uh, as someone leading in nature, there's almost a cognitive dissonance of matching me as a black woman um, with having a certain set of skills. Even when I'm demonstrating it in front of someone, um, they will still overlook or talk to me as if I'm not able or don't know about that thing. One example that comes to mind was having a conversation with someone. I'd just taught children in a wood um, how to produce their own artist charcoal, and then we were drawing with them. And he said to me, oh, have you ever made charcoal? It's, you know, it's a really fun thing to do. 
so but I, I just showed you and demonstrated what I've been doing but that kind of blanking um, is very common um, I had an experience a couple of weeks ago um, of an external walk leader coming in to do some training with a group I've been working with um, and we could have been working I don't know for a nail bar or fish and chip shop he was unable to acknowledge that we were an outdoor organization that had already developed the skill set of this particular group of people to a certain level and to engage with them as people with with knowledge and skills um, he was unable to acknowledge that um, as people of color that we would have an interest uh, and a skill set i've often um, been excluded from certain settings um, professionally so there are, are membership bodies for uh, people working in the outdoors whether you're a mountaineer kayaker bushcraft professional um, and they offer cpd um, events and experiences and i've attended them in the woods as a bushcraft practitioner um, typically um, the other practitioners are white male either they're ex-military or more often than not um, they're what i would call um, the wannabes, they wish they were um, in the military. And there's a particular attitude that, that goes with that. Um, but I arrive in the woods uh, not knowing who I'm going to encounter in the middle of nowhere. Um, and I always do a bit of checking out who's here, are there women pe here, uh, what are the people like, getting a sense of safety. Um, on one particular occasion, uh, the conversation around the fire turned to, oh, I like the good old days when you could be sexist or racist, you didn't have to be politically correct, and then broke into doing impersonations of the, uh, the black mammy from Tom and Jerry. And it's something that I felt assertive enough to challenge at the time, but I felt if 15 men are able to do this in front of me, they probably don't really care, and I'm not sure that um, I want to deal with any fallout of raising this here and now. So made my complaint later, um, to which they made it very clear that they thought it was a non-issue, and for them it was just fond memories, and had I not considered that. Um, this particular organisation is responsible for um, accredited training that insurers are now looking for. And it's certainly not a body that I want to send any of my staff or volunteers to. So in that way, um, you become excluded from knowledge base and professional development and continuing your learning. Um, there are many, many encounters. I sometimes get really fed up talking to my, uh, my colleagues and fellow directors. That it's a weekly occurrence of being considered less than and being assumed not to know. Um, the majority of other white professionals I encounter will assume I'm sort of new money, if you like, that if I do have any knowledge, then I've only learnt it in the last year or so. Um, it's quite hard for them to accept that I might have... Um, uh, any kind of history of um, thank you. Yeah. Lovely. O of working in the outdoors. Um, in leading groups uh, of people of colour in the natural world, I've often sort of had my group hijacked by a white conservationist who will come along and assume that there's going to be no leader in a group of people of colour. Thank you and who will start talking to the group, telling them things that I've already just explained to them or I'm about to. And, and it's very intrusive. And you sort of politely say, well, we're in the middle of a, a course here. Um, and, and they'll carry on or become quite defensive. Um, it's, it's really difficult to navigate the, the space assertively. Um, I think the cognitive dissonance is, is so strong um, that they will only see you as being awkward or difficult if you say, well, actually, I'm in the middle of teaching here. Um, it, it happens when I teach uh, map and navigation skills. It's always, oh, are you lost? Can we help you? Oh, no, we're, we're just learning. We're fine. Thank you. Oh, but I can show you the way. And having to keep repeating the message that actually there's some teaching going on, um, it, it's quite difficult to, to break through um, a perception of, of ignorance, really. Um, so talking a little bit more about community and belonging. So within Wild in the City, um, we had wanted to work with everyone, but it was quite clear that um, a lot of uh, white people in the general public weren't necessarily wanting to learn from um, a black woman and certainly not um, 
a black-led organisation. So we found that where we were really having an impact was working with people of colour to help provide a secure base, to feel confident in nature and to uh, make their own journeys with their family and community into exploring. So we have um, a programme called Nature Connectures, which is aimed at... Um, all different levels of experience. Some people come not having any experience of stepping into woodlands or, or natural spaces. Some people come, they've climbed mountains, they're involved in scout groups or, or farms. But what we all tend to have in common is that we haven't spent time in nature with other people of colour. Our experience is often of that of being the only one and the discomfort that can come from that. And it's been a really uh, powerful experience of reinstating the oral tradition for learning. So we're very relational and conversational. It's not about handouts or, or learning in any kind of heady way. And it's through enjoying walks and conversation and uh, looking at traditional crafts and wildlife identification that uh, we familiarise nature. So it's becoming more of a friend than a stranger but also linking learning about plants and animals to plants and animals that are familiar in countries of heritage. For example, sharing um, the okra, which is edible, its roots, leaves and, and flowers. Sorry, mallow um, is edible uh, and is in the same family as okra and behaves in the same way. So we make links between plant families and their uses, which help people to learn and understand the properties and benefits of, of different plants. What's great about the Nature Connectors program is most people that come on it are then boosted in confidence to go off and do their own exploration, taking their children, their friends, their fam family out with them. We often get asked, oh, you must work with children, and we do, but that's a small amount of what we do. In our experience, it's best to train black adults because we have children. Um, that if you work just with children, that's wonderful, but if they don't have a black adult who can then continue that relationship with them, uh, it's short-lived. But also, as black adults, we're experiencing difficulties and hostilities engaging with uh, more white environmental organisations. Um, there's a bit of disconnect there if we're encouraging children to then go into these organisations that we ourselves feel uncomfortable with. So that's been our approach to... Um, support black adults to feel more comfortable in nature so they then take their children and a generational chain is then recreated where oral information can be passed on about the natural world. So these are some pictures here of our, our nature connectors. Um, all ages, so from very early 20s to uh, 70s, just enjoying conversation and a sense of community around the fire. All of these pictures are taken um, in the London area. And we really have built a community of, of people of colour that, that like to gather in nature for fun, to learn and, and to feel good. So we're now coming to a, a different phase in our development where we're looking to build a strong black leadership team of people that can facilitate others in nature. So as well as uh, walk leadership and woodland living skills, we also have a focus on ecotherapy, uh, using uh, time in nature to support well-being. So these four here are our first uh, nature guides who are started training with us this year in January. And that's been a really powerful experience, um, taking them on a journey from reflecting on their own relationship with nature to then thinking about how to facilitate other people in their enjoyment of the natural world and what it's like for them to develop skills and all the issues that brings up as they encounter some of the, um, the white attitudes that I was referring to. Um, for, for some people who haven't spent any time of nature, um, they're stepping into something um, for the first time, but are doing so rooted in a black secure base. And that feels very different from those that have a history of being in nature, but didn't have any sense of black community in which to enjoy it. Um, so it's been fascinating to see <coughs> a sense of confidence that can be developed when people feel that there's a space for them in which they belong um, to then find their confidence to explore and to lead. So 2020 is, is going to be an exciting year for us when these guys are ready uh, to go out into the field and, and to lead others. Um, I think I'll, I'll leave that there and any questions afterwards. Was it? Thank you.